Good afternoon, friends. Hail and well met, those of us in this room and those of us who are joining us through the magic of technology. This is the day that the Creator is creating. We roll up our sleeves and take part in that, yes? Welcome, welcome, welcome. I think there's no need for me to introduce myself. I think that you've all seen me before, and I understand that you've had many adventures since we left. I was sitting here thinking one time when my daughter, who is about to turn 30, was about a year and a half old, I had started taking her to a daycare for a couple days a week because I thought possibly socialization might be a good idea. Um, I don't know how that worked out, but we tried it. And at any rate, one day, she was just really acting up in the grocery store. And I remember finally, I just on the counter. I said, what on earth is going on with you? I love you, but I do not love your behavior today. And she said, if you love me, then why do you keep leaving me all the time? Well, I said, because you have a life, and I have a life, and we both have our own adventures, so we can tell them come back together. <laughs> I don't know if she bought it, but that's how I feel about all of you. You know, we see each other once in a while, we go off and have our own lives, our own adventures, and we come back and still have the beautiful, beloved community that we have because we are followers and carriers of the Christ. Yes? Amen. So let us together read our land acknowledgement this morning. We gratefully acknowledge the Dakota peoples on whose ancestral homelands we gather. We acknowledge this land has a complex and layered history. We pay respect to the elders who have stewarded the land throughout the generations and continue to do so. We recognize and give thanks that we are creatures of the earth living in the ecosystem that is unique to Minnesota. May we honor one another and honor life itself. Amen. Not that it's a prayer, but it is a prayer of its own kind, isn't it? So, uh, announcements. Let's see those together. Is somebody else coming up to do those? Or are we just... Well, let's all read it together. You are invited to Hillary Flynn's ordination ceremony tomorrow. And yay, what an extraordinary thing at Wyzetta Community Church in the sanctuary. If you are an ordained person, please bring your robe if you have one. Gather in the library as we will walk in with Hillary. How many ordained persons are in the room today? A couple of us. <laughs> there you go. That's what you got the robe for. All right, <laughs> next week, we will welcome Dustin Moretz to our church. He's presently finish up, finishing up his pastoral training at Luther Seminary. That makes us curious, yes? Have you met him? Seen him? Anything? Ooh, I know you'll be good to him. You are so loving to your pastor folks. I, you really, really are. Please know that about yourselves. You are a kind congregation. Next week, oh no, council meets Monday night at 6.30 p.m. Anyone is welcome to attend. Anyone. Grab them off the streets. Okay. Is that it? One slide worth? All right. Our announcements are finished. And let's do the transition moment, Dick. Uh, let me just say thank you to Chris for getting us started. We're still here. We're on our own. And, uh, and uh, we are so grateful that, y y that you're here. It feels a little bit safer, doesn't it? Uh, we have a transition team. Uh, Joanne, Chris, Vince, Dick, Deb, Kay, and anybody else who would like to participate uh, in uh, the planning of, of what we do, do now. Um, I wanted to say uh, that I thought we did a great job with our farewell to uh, Pastor Zoe. That was a great day yesterday and great fellowship. I know she enjoyed it very much. Uh, she sent Deb a picture uh, from Spain holding her uh, two grandchildren uh, already today and you can ask her about that. Uh, we gave her a very nice gift. I don't want to say what it was publicly, but if you ask me privately, I'll tell you. Uh, it's impressive. 
uh, I feel like, from this congregation. Uh, I've been tasked with um, ensuring that we have worship services between now and May 25th, and we're using uh, pulpit uh, supply uh, to do that, guest preachers. And um, uh, four of the next five are seminary students. So we, 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 all of a sudden we're a training congregation uh, and uh, we want to be supportive and make them feel good about, uh, about what they do. Dustin Moretz will be with us next week. He, he graduates from Luther Seminary uh, May the 18th. His background is UCC. He's 30-ish. He's been involved in some... I've got it right here. Um, uh, he did a study uh, abroad program in India. Uh, he has a master's degree in conflict resolution from Trinity College Dublin. Um, his first job after graduate school, I can't say the word, at the Corimelia community in Northern Ireland. So he has some experience. And uh, I, I have talked to him on the phone, and he, he seems like a fine fellow, and I think we'll enjoy what he has to bring to us. And uh, Chun Chi will be bringing us our music. So on we go. Uh, we've conducted four listening sessions with the congregation, including the one at the annual meeting. The transcripts of those are all uh, on our, you can access them through our uh, website. Uh, all names have been removed, uh, but the content is there. And we have heard the congregation say to us that, that you're looking for continuity, you want to lift up our identity, communication is very important to you, and we've tried to put uh, transition updates in uh, our weekly update, and we'll do them every week at worship now, and any other ways that we can think of to communicate what's going on. We want you to know what's going on. There's no secret cabal behind the scenes making this happen. We're, we're in this together. Uh, and so uh, um, we have a commitment, I think, from the congregation to move forward. Some of us are nervous about that, hesitant about that, but I, my, my sense is that there's a commitment to move forward. And uh, we, we have lots of questions that we can't answer uh, about how we're going to find candidates to be our new pastor. We're still working on that. Uh, we have some ideas, we have some leads, we have some possibilities, but we have nothing uh, concrete. <clears throat> We did have a consultant from the UCC come meet, <clears throat> come meet with us and give us some counsel and advice, and he introduced a new idea for us. Our original plan was to just use guest preachers every week, and we've heard the congregation say, well, that's, a, you know, that's nice, but we're looking for a little bit more continuity. We'd like a little bit more continuity of that. I don't think we need an interim minister to do the work that interim ministers usually do. So I had never heard of this concept before of a bridge pastor. So uh, the transition team will make a presentation to council on Monday night about what a bridge pastor is and, uh, and, uh, and an outline of, of how we, we might do that. That would be a, a three month kind of position so that we wouldn't have a different person each week, but we'd have the same person for, uh, for three months. There, there may or may not be an impact financially, and if there is, we'll have to come back to the congregation and ask for your input uh, on that. Uh, Joanne, when's, our, when's the next meeting of the transition team? In, okay, so uh, 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 this Monday is the 22nd, so so it'll be the 29th is the next transition meeting, and we'd love for you to have come up. I have a sign-up sheet for our worship services to help with some of the uh, stuff that uh, we don't uh, want a, a guest preacher uh, to have to do who doesn't know us, uh, and that maybe we don't trust as much. So uh, you're going to have to sign up uh, uh, for that. Thank you. To work, okay. Uh. Let's sing together a prelude 
And the last time I was here, I forgot to light the candle. <sighs> so here we are. How pleasant and harmonious when God's people are together, refreshing as the dew upon the mountain of our God. I invite you all to rise in body and or spirit for the call to worship. We gather this morning to worship as one body. We catch our breaths and turn our hearts and minds toward God and wonder, what is our duty here among the people of the earth? How shall we be love and peace here and now? Isaiah the prophet proclaimed it. The spirit of the sovereign is on me to proclaim good news to the very edges of the community. We, we are to bind, bind up the broken hearted, hearted proclaim, proclaim freedom, freedom for the, the captive, and bring, and bring prisoners of darkness, darkness into light. light. No matter the turmoil, within and without, we trust God's presence and power to comfort those who mourn and, and lift, lift up, up those, those who, who grieve. grieve to bestow on them a crown of beauty instead, instead of, of ashes, ashes and anoint them with the oil of gladness instead, instead of, of sadness, sadness, to wrap them in a garment of praise instead, instead of, of the chill of despair, despair, to bring new life out of certain death in acts of resurrection. We yeah, are made to be planters, planters builders, builders, restorers, restorers in, in the places of ruin and devastation. devastation. We, we are people of God. Hear us sing. listening sessions, it was clear to us there was a desire for us to lift up our identity and to affirm it. And so we're going to uh, say our we believe statements each week. 
uh, about three a week. There's, there's 13 of them. So uh, we're going to stand and do our first three uh, We Believe statements. Will you follow along with me? We believe the umbrella of God's love as exemplified in Jesus Christ is big enough for everyone to be welcomed. We believe that love, not doctrine, holds us together. We believe we are called to love and affirm all marginalized peoples, including all in the LGBTQIA plus community. You may be, oh, would you turn to your neighbor and wish them the peace of Christ as the church has done for 1,000, 2,000 years. Peace of Christ be with you. for scripture and you know I get all excited about that <laughs> you haven't seen one of my fancy scriptures for a while so Vince why don't you show us so I'm just trying to show you something particular with the way I've laid this on the page and the way we'll read it together and I think you'll see it right away there are three different translations one of them is the living Bible and Vince has put it all in white 
and we get to the message, and it's got that gold color. We get to the easy to read, it's yellow. We get to the common English, it's blue. Well, the color coding doesn't matter so much, except what I've done, and you'll see how it falls out. Each translation says it just a little bit differently, a little bit differently, a little bit differently. And I think the whole point of all of them, it's trying to get real con concrete. So um, I'm just going to read this out loud. And you all are always welcome to read. Um, if you want to challenge yourself, pick a color. And every time it comes up, read it or something like that. But here we go. See what you can figure out just by looking at it laid out this way. Okay, prologue. Later that same day, after rushing back to Jerusalem with the disciples, to be with the disciples, the two travelers from Emmaus told their story of how Jesus had appeared to them as they were walking along the road, and now how they had recognized him as he was breaking the bread. Is this a new story to anyone in the room? Okay. All right. So here we are on the road. And just as they were telling about it, Jesus himself was suddenly standing there among them, and greeted them. So this is not the road to Emmaus. This is back in the room, inside the locked room. But the whole group was terribly frightened, thinking they were seeing a ghost. Are you frightened? He asked. Look at my hands and my feet. It's really me. Touch me. You can see that I have a living body. A ghost does not have a body like this. After Jesus told them this, he showed them his hands and his feet. The followers were amazed and very, very happy to see that Jesus was alive. They still could not believe what they saw. They stood there undecided, filled with joy and doubt. Then he asked them, do you have anything here to eat? They gave him a piece of broiled fish, a piece of cooked fish, a piece of leftover fish that they had cooked, a piece of baked fish. And he ate it as they watched. Jesus said to them, these are my words that I spoke while his mouth was full, I guess. Not all of them. These are the words I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law from Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms must be fulfilled. He went on to open their understanding of the word of God. He said, you can see now how it is written that the Messiah suffers, rises from the dead on the third day, and then a total life change through the forgiveness of sins is proclaimed in his name to all nations, starting from here, from Jerusalem. First to hear and see it. You are the witness. The living word of God, living in the people of God, thanks be to God. I knew a woman once, a character in the neighborhood, whose name was Mary Alice. She was elegant and edgy, crotchety and creative, and utterly recognizable by anyone who knew her. I think you've probably known her by some other name in your lifetime. She was a force to be reckoned with in all the best ways. And when she passed on to glory, we held a celebration of her life. Her family made a series of buttons in her honor, little pins like you pin to your jacket, to give out to all the guests at the service. Each of the buttons had a saying on it that she was known for. There were a dozen different kinds, all kinds of them utterly recognizable as pure Mary Alice. I'd show you one, except I gave them all away that day. <laughs> they said, onward and upwards. It's yours to decide. Say no more. And many other things. Mary Alice, beloved, known, now gone. Now imagine this with me. What if... After the service, at the end of the day, what if a couple of her nephews, say, are walking toward a res restaurant to get a bite to eat 
after we've celebrated her and blessed her and said our goodbyes. And they meet a stranger. And they tell this stranger all about their aunt. And then they sit down together to share a bite to eat. And the stranger opens her menu. And as the others begin to wrangle over what to order, she says, well, it's yours to decide. And when they look at her in shocked silence, she winks and says, onward and upwards. And then they begin to sputter. And because of all of a sudden, when they look at her, her eyes look awfully familiar. And she says, say no more. And then she disappears. <laughs> That's a little bit like what happens in the prologue of our scripture story today. The story of the disciples. The story they're telling about this locked room what happened on the road to Emmaus and at the table later. Now, Mary Alice is Mary Alice and Jesus is Jesus, and there is a considerable difference between the two, but also a considerable overlap. One of them, only one of them, in our stories of the days after their departure, keeps popping up in the flesh, on the road, on the lake shore, in a locked room, not gone at all. Jesus shows up on the road to Emmaus, the road out of town, the afternoon of the day the open tomb is discovered, and is not recognized. This utterly recognizable man. And then is recognized specifically by his actions at the table. And the followers of Jesus rush back into town to tell the rest, we've seen Jesus again. And what happens next is, <laughs> it is simply inexplicable. Literally and actually, both. What is going on is just not explainable in plain language. We have no common knowledge that we share among us that explains a physical body showing up inside a locked room without opening a door or a window. But it happens in this story. It happens with Jesus. And the disciples, the whole group, are terribly frightened, thinking they're seeing a ghost. What else could it be? Well, what would we think? But no. Jesus intentionally makes it very clear. I have a physical body. He's touchable. Touch me, he says. Look at me. See me, he says. How strange. He's both gone and here. One of them must begin it, reaching out a finger like a toe testing the swimming pool water, <laughs> and then more follow until each one is reaching, and they, they must crowd around him and bump into each other. So glad to see him. How wonderful, smelling each other, feeling the roughness of one another's cloaks, jostling. It's so physical. It's so utterly real and touchable and mysterious. How can it happen? There's no explanation for this kind of thing. Joy and doubt, doubt and joy, fully both. This cannot get any more outrageously non-explainable until it does. Jesus is hungry. <laughs> He's hungry. He asks for food. Do you have food? He asks, and they do. And oh, how I love what happens next. You can tell by the way I share it with you. We all stand still and watch Jesus eat. <laughs> we just watch him eat a piece of fish. Was it broiled? It was cooked somehow? Might have been left over? Could have been baked? Takes a while to eat it. Bones? Holds it, breaks it. Bite by bite. Mm. And we have plenty of time to think. We have plenty of time to figure it out. And the one thing we know beyond all doubt is what is happening right now is way beyond the ordinary. We are on a whole different plane of reality here. We are here together with Jesus. Once we are here, we are in a new place where old rules do not apply. And Jesus says, okay, 
Okay, see what's happening. I told you I would fulfill the writings and prophecies of our ancestors. Remember when I told you? The Messiah suffers and dies and three days later begins a whole new era of the world. A total life change through resurrection, the forgiveness of sins in Jesus' name to all nations starting from right here. A turnover, a redo. And he says, you are the first to hear it, you are the first to see it, you are the witnesses. In me, the prophecies of the Messiah are fulfilled. Fulfilled. Filled, full, full of filling, full to the edges, finished, fulfilled. This is a word we can have trouble catching hold of. When's the last time you used it in a sentence? Yet it is a concrete word. It's, it's descriptive. In Greek, the word is astonishing. Ekpleru. Ekpleru. <laughs> It sounds Susian. It means to fill fully or to fill out. You can fill a cup. You can fill out a coat. You can fulfill a promise. Jesus fulfilling the prophecies is a lot like all of that. Just as real as filling a cup. Just as real as keeping a promise. Think now of a garment that you own, a coat or a blouse or a perfect pair of pants or shoes that you adore or have a special purpose or a hat that you never fish or golf without. A hat that would be ridiculous on me, by the way, but it's perfect for you because it's yours. Think of that garment or that hat or those shoes and how when you put it on, you fulfill it. And yes, sometimes you fill it full. <laughs> There's a pastor's robe I wear sometimes. I certainly don't fill it full all the way to the edges. But when I put it on, I begin to fulfill the role it implies, both to me and to others. Others can tell that I am about some kind of spiritual business when I put it on. There's some kind of match, some kind of fit, so much so that it actually increases my ability to fulfill the robe, to, to fulfill the role, to fill the robe, yeah? So, do filling your gardening shoes urge you to go to the garden? Does that hat I've mentioned help bring the fish? <laughs> or does it simply cause you to wait in more patient anticipation for the fish to come? or not? <laughs> Do the shoes call you to the garden even before you put them on? Does the hat whisper to you a fish even when you are on dry land? What I'm trying to say is we choose what, we, what it is that we wish to fulfill. We choose our promises. How shall we clothe ourselves? Particularly when we, you, are in a transition of wardrobes so to speak. You are going into a new season. The disciples in the wake of the departure of their leader are in a situation a little like yours. Their rabbi, their leader, their pastor has gone. And necessity demands they decide who they are now as they go forward. They need to identify the role they are called to fulfill. Their old role as foot followers of Jesus on the dusty paths, as they knew him, is no longer available. The one they were following has gone. But the way, the way still exists. The way is still with them. The community has not so much outgrown an identity, as, at, at, at least not from their own point of view, as it has departed from them. It has changed, it has transformed. It is different than the way they understood. Simply put, they need to redefine. So what will they wear? <laughs> what shall you wear, beloved community? Put on the garments of praise, our scripture says. Quoting Isaiah, we sing it. You can do that. 
Or you could choose to wear the belt of truth from Paul's letter to the Ephesians. That's a good belt, time-trusted, strong. You could gird yourselves with a towel, as Jesus does on Maundy Thursday in the Gospel of John. That you can do for sure. I have come to know you, know you as having habits of service to others. It's yours to decide, Mary Alice says. We choose, don't we? Onward and upward, she says. We hope. We outgrow old garments, old roles. You know, once upon a time, like many of you, I carried a diaper bag everywhere I went. <laughs> part of the role of being mother to a little tiny child. But children grow. I no longer have that required role. Say no more, Mary Alice whispers. We go forward. So if you pause to think, friends, you will remember the roles you have fulfilled. And you will move on to fill new ones. You will remember personal roles and roles held here as part of the body of spirit of peace. You'll remember Pastor Zoe, maybe every time you put on one of the scarves that were hers to fulfill. And you will perhaps challenge yourself to follow in her footsteps in some way whenever you wear that scarf. Maybe it'll help you sing with just a little more zest. You will be able to think of what you'd like to wear next. There are all manner of uniforms to fulfill and to fill, from nurses to Target employees. There are prayer shawls. There are coats with dozens of pockets that also need filling, and aprons, and the mantles of authority that are waiting to be claimed. If justice is a vest, what does it look like? How do you wear robes of compassion? What does it mean to put on your gospel shoes? What garments have you outgrown? And what are sturdy enough for another season? All of these are your questions as you look for a perfect fit and continue to grow. Jesus said to those gathered, and we are among them this morning, I am fulfilling the prophecies. You are the witnesses, the first to understand. And to this day, there is a role, a task, a promise for each of us to fulfill, perfectly tailored to our gifts and graces. And for all of you together as a community of the spirit of peace, there is an identity to fulfill. And it will be an exquisite fit. Jesus came back from the other side of death to invite us to follow, to make sure we understood that he is the real deal, the savior of this world. And we are to, in a sense, wear his inherited hand-me-downs to put on his ways. When Jesus dons the identity of Messiah, it fits like a glove, like it was made for him as it was and is and ever shall be. The creator of the universe is a fine tailor and there is a garment promised to us as well and a call for this beloved community to fulfill. Onwards and upwards, it's yours to decide. I'll say no more. We come now to our communion table. Let's prepare with a song.
Beloved friends, each and every one of us is invited to this table. We are invited in our wisdom and our foolishness, our strength and our weakness, our aloneness and our togetherness in community. Let's prepare with a prayer of confession and the promise of forgiveness. Everywhere and always, God, we often do not understand what we do. The good we want to do, we often do not do. The evil we do not want to do, we keep on doing. We live from forgiveness to forgiveness, and we do not understand how you forgive us, how you love us, and give us endless new beginnings. Still, together here, we accept the mystery of your grace and claim your promise of forgiveness as we go forward made new. We embrace the freedom you offer us in the name of your Son, and to ourselves and to each other we proclaim, in the name of Christ, you are forgiven. Amen. We, came to this, we come to this table, one by one and together, for a reason. Let us proclaim together. Here, by the grace of God, we proclaim freedom for the bound, justice for the oppressed, food for the hungry, and homecoming for the prodigal. We come to this table to be strengthened, to imagine a community of justice and freedom where no one is set aside, but all are welcomed in grace. We imagine and then dedicate ourselves to being that community. As you sing, I will prepare these elements, and then they will be distributed. I will ask the servers to come forward at the appropriate time. Let's begin. Pour yourself into these elements so that they may, they may become for us real and physical means of grace. Amen. Our table is ready. Will the servers please come?
We'll sing the last verse of our communion hymn as the prayer, and then I will pray, and we will go into the Lord's Prayer together. God, you are everywhere and always. Do you see us love each other? Can you see us giving ourselves to this world? Please see us. You are here in these moments of our transitioning. You are here when we are sure. You are here when we stumble. You are here. You are here. You are here. And so, God, with all of your people on this beautiful blue earth, we lift up our voices in one of our oldest prayers, and we pray together the words that Jesus taught us. Our Creator, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us as we forgive those who trespass against us. And let us not be led into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Let's sing. And so we go. In a moment, there'll be a prelude. You're all invited to either wander away during it and use it for your walking music or to sit and enjoy it, sing along at will. Well, why do we go? Where do we go? What do we do? What are we for? Let's go to be to one another and especially to those to whom love is a stranger good and true friends. Amen? Amen.
Thank you.